press record now. All right, no worries. I filter myself then. <laughs> yeah. Appropriately. Well, thank you for coming in and being uh, a part of our process. You bet. Thank you for doing this. Yeah. And, um, since uh, it was only a couple hours since we last saw each other, yes, and exactly. this round or yes. on this, we'll just get right to right to questions. Sure. Um, at uh, well, do we want to start? And just do you want to give a little elevator pitch about why people should support you? Sure. So I'll start with I'm Tammy Beatty. I've been a county commissioner since 2007. And, you know, it's been an incredible journey. I love the uh, ability to serve our community, and I want to continue to do that. Why? Um, government works at a glacial type of speed. Um, so things that I started working on 10 years ago are just now coming to fruition. A good example would be looking at our non-resource lands, the lands in which have been um, what we consider to be mapping errors around Deschutes County. What does that mean for us? Well, it, it doesn't mean that those areas would be considered um, next for high density, but it does mean that, first of all, from a water conservation perspective, individuals might not be trying to keep their um, farmland green. We could actually rezone that in another way to where maybe they could it could be MUA 10 or something that might be able to afford different types of um, land value and uh, use of the land as well. Um, health services, we are on the forefront of being able to look at our mental health system um, and that's something that I've been asked to be a part of. Initiatives that county commissioners, um, through the amount of time that you serve and the relationships that you develop, you get a chance to be at the table to really affect change statewide, which definitely um, influences the ability for us to meet the needs of our own community. So. I want to serve another four years. I love what I have a chance to do with our community, and that's why I'm running. Mm -hmm. Great. The, um, I'm going to kind of do these questions in reverse order, what I thought, but the, um, you know, most of, as the, as the job description has changed and growth has increased in the county, um, from an outside perspective, it would seem like land use issues are now occupying far more time than they used to and um, I wonder if you could just speak to the change the way that your position has changed since the time you came in and do you um, is that an accurate reflection land you I mean land use being you know the majority of your job description so the role of a county commissioner is both legislative and quasi-judicial so land use actions property rights is uh, probably 75 percent of the time that we spend as a commissioner so you are correct has that changed? When I first got elected, Measure 37 and Measure 49 were online. And those were the property rights bills about um, land use ability prior to uh, Senate Bill 100 in the state of Oregon. If you owned your land before some of those laws came online, right. would you be able to use your land um, the same now? So um, my day one became about land use and my background was in health services. So commissioners need to make sure that they are up to speed on understanding our code, understanding the law, and how you apply that in an objective manner. Deschutes County is a county of first impression in a lot of ways. So a lot of the land use issues that come to us, other counties are not necessarily um, dealing with. We have the second largest unincorporated area in the state of Oregon. And so we have this urban and rural mix that makes us really unique. And we love that about ourselves, but we also find that to be, I as a commissioner, one of our greatest challenges. So how we address that is through being educated, making sure that we are objective, and then it is a huge part of what a county commissioner does and should do. What do you, um, what do you feel the balance should be between um, the role that the county commissioner plays in county as opposed to the role that the county commissioner plays at the state level? Well, certainly it's important to be responsive and present for your constituents. So our board meets every Monday and Wednesday, and then we hold office hours just like uh, any, anyone else would in an office setting. Getting out to community, often we wouldn't be sitting in behind a desk, but could be meeting in Sisters or Lapine or wherever. Um, one of the important things that I feel is that we often feel uh, critical of the state and the legislature and what they are doing in terms of setting policy that maybe is a one-size-fits-all. 
So I have made it an, um, a priority of my own to get involved as a county commissioner at the state level in setting policy that directly affects our livability and the economic vitality of our county. So I see that as really important. If we, and I've said this a hundred times, but if we are not at the table, I've watched us be on the menu time and time again, and we can sit back and say that, you know, that darn state is doing all these things to us, or we can be at the table informing those decisions and helping them to understand how policy shifts at the state could directly affect our community in a negative way. So if we are able to help guide that, I can't think of anything that better serves our community. What are some of the specifics, specific ways that you as a commissioner um, interact at the state level? So a couple of ways. One, the Transportation Commission. So the Oregon Transportation Commission oversees the Department of Transportation, which sets the policies for the state of Oregon around transportation. Things like access management is critical to the success of a community. Being able to address things like congestion, being able to address things like safety, those policies are set at the state level and I currently chair that, that commission. Next, I have sat on the Oregon Housing Stability Council, which sets out the mm -hmm. statewide housing plan, and we are developing the first statewide housing plan of Oregon. We've operated off the 10-year plan to end homelessness, which was a statewide effort, but we haven't had a strategic vision really for how the state is going to invest limited uh, tax credits and limited resources to be able to meet the needs of community. And so being able, again, to look at what target populations we need to be addressing, uh, how rural communities, small capacity communities, being able to access funds, and again setting those policies of who is able to actually access funds and how we get those dollars into community is critical to success. Um, you mentioned the 10 year plan to end homelessness. Have, have, do you think that was a success? Well, when I first started as part of the 10 year plan to end homelessness, one of the questions was, will we ever end homelessness? And the answer was no, but it's better than saying we're going to try to end homelessness. So what happened right after we wrote the 10-year plan to end homelessness was the recession. And so the housing mix looks vastly different than it does today. And so that also was a statewide initiative that was led by the federal government down into community. And I think what we lost was at the state level the oversight of being able to assist communities in working on those plans. The grassroots, ground level um, push from the community was critical, but at the time of the economic recession, there just wasn't capacity on the ground to influence how that work continued. So it, quite frankly, sat on a shelf. Um, what did it do? It helped communities, though, identify what gaps they have in their community. And so for us, looking at shelter beds that are necessary, emergency housing that's necessary, looking at the mix of housing that's uh, needed to meet all levels, those things are still relevant, so now we're taking that information, putting it into the statewide housing plan, and determining how do we go forward as a state in addressing affordability and affordable housing. Mm -hmm. Are there any specifics about the affordability piece that you'd like to share? I'm just curious about well, there's Well, there, um, if we look at workforce housing and we look at affordable housing, so if we're looking at tax credit projects or if we're looking at kind of the development to be able to have um, single family homes or home ownership, the delta in between from the state is huge. A lot of the mix that we had on the market back in 2008 looked vastly different than it does today. We don't have the rental market to be able to offset. Um, so if the question is, you know, what areas should we be targeting? It depends on where you are in the state of Oregon. For us, clearly, we have about, just in the city of Bend, we miss, right now we're missing about 5,000 units, and that's it, all mixtures, to actually have housing that's going to meet the needs of our communities. And so we, right now, are addressing some of the issues around veterans homelessness and veterans housing. That's certainly a critical access point. Um, but I think you could say that really there isn't a part of our mix of housing that isn't in need of additional funding. Mm -hmm. I guess I was just curious more about um, the specific steps to address that gap as opposed to knowing that Oh, sure. Well, from a state perspective, we don't have enough to, funds to address every need. So what we're trying to do, and we have a retreat on the 26th, which is next week, to take a look at the initial findings within the statewide uh, housing plan and try and target certain areas within community. 
So what we do right now is that if you're a developer and you're providing low-income housing in a community, you apply and we put you through a process. What we don't right now have is a look at what are the targeted most critical needs within community. So it's applicant driven versus vision driven mm -hmm. in terms of how um, we can be all things to all people but we won't be able to meet the outcomes that we're trying to achieve. So this is more of a strategic fashion. It also is looking at other ways that we can, um, working with the state agencies such as ODOT, um, such as uh, the development, so DLCD, develop, um, the Department of Land Conservation and Development, what lands do they also have within community that we might be able to actually put into uh, affordability, meaning Habitat for Humanity was able to take ownership of some land that ODOT had as surplus. So they that type of conversation statewide, because um, it's a mix of, in Bend, the cost for land is incredibly extraordinary. So it's, it's cost prohibitive to build affordable. If we have lands that are owned by the state of Oregon and we match those with the dollars that the legislature has put forward, then it frees up the ability for a, de a development to go forward. Mm -hmm. Does that tie into the, some of the shifting of um, the exterior lands in Deschutes County that you mentioned at the beginning of your pitch here? Well, one of the challenges, we have mapping errors and EFU land, high value land in the state of Oregon is the most restrictive zone that we have. The same EFU land zone is the same in Bend, is, or uh, Deschutes County rather, is the same that is in the Willamette Valley, so Yamhill County that's growing grapes. So we need to recognize, in my opinion, what some of those mapping errors look like. Back in 1978-79, when we put in our first comprehensive plan, there were lands that were left, and in our commissioner journals from that time was for another day, we'll deal with it later. Well, now is later. So we have lands that we are protecting such a, um, and suggesting that they're high value farmland, but the soils classifications don't meet that need. Um, so how can those lands be used differently? Um, does it mean that they would go into high density? No, because there isn't another zone that you would walk down that would provide in Oregon a high density um, rezoning from an EFU. But does it mean that we could be looking at those lands to be able to allow a second dwelling on them? Possibly. Does it mean that we could be looking at maybe accessory dwellings? Possibly. That was something that the legislature looked at last year. Mm -hmm. But we have these areas around our uh, fastest growing city in, well really in the West Coast, that maybe we could be using differently, but right now have been locked down into this, but they are high value farmlands conversation. So what would it look like next? It would be a conversation with our community as to what they would want, and certainly with the state of Oregon as to what they would allow. Mm -hmm. There is a pilot project right now, House Bill 4079, that's doing just that. They're looking at two pilot projects in the state of Oregon where they would take 40 acres and allow that to be used um, for, I think it's uh, 30, it has a, a minimum of 30% affordability, and it's land that's not within an urban growth boundary, which again goes back to Senate Bill 100. And it can be lands, so the county has land in Redmond that we would be willing to partner with the city on. So you have some market rate housing, you have low income housing, you have mixed, uh, you know, mixed units, so you would have multifamily housing, single family housing, you, just a multitude of different types of housing within a 40 acre period, plan development, think, kind of um, maybe Northwest Crossing-ish, but the uh, benefit of a developer being able to use land, first of all, that's available, second of all, that's low cost or no cost, you would use the revenue generated from the market rate to be able to offset the cost of building affordable mm -hmm. housing and then be able to add to that mix. So the county's perspective in that would be we would want to not just use the minimum, we would want to request that they have more affordability than just the pilot minimum. And so those are ways that, so this buffer of what does it mean with those non-resource lands, which every land has resource, how do we get the best resource out of that, in particular while we have a housing crisis? Mm -hmm. Interesting. I'm going to shift the uh, questioning over to what seems to be the most popular topic at the county commission race, marijuana. Yes. And, um, you know, we uh, at the debate last night, there were a lot of numbers thrown around regarding the amount of revenue that, that is coming in. Do you feel that revenue, and I know that revenue hasn't been spent yet, um, 
but what what do you feel the revenue should be spent on and is it as a group do you feel like you're spending in the right areas so we will receive about 476 annual uh 476,000 annually is that a lot of revenue no uh, what will that be able to provide for the county a lot more in terms of enforcement Another side that we have a conversation, um, we, sorry, my phone is ringing. <laughs> um, so those funds, we've already had a conversation as a board to move forward with hiring an enforcement officer. And we are partnering with the city of Bend of bringing on another enforcement officer as well. Those individuals would be part of the Central Oregon Drug Enforcement Team. That's important because they have the ability to work with um, the, the uh, code team as a whole. They also would be able to work with the district attorney's office. We have one single point of contact there as well. Um, it's an effort to get our arms around some of the illegal activity that's going on and those that might be um, on the medical side that are unregulated respectfully and um, making sure that they're within compliance. So that would take probably two, 200,000 or so of that. The remainder is left to be uh, for discussion. A couple areas that I see that are critical. One, offsetting the cost that it takes for our community development department to actually process applications. We are a county that, uh, because it is a land use, they need a LUX, a land use compatibility statement, in order to move forward with an application. Many applications, and actually I, I can't think of anything really that doesn't get appealed in Deschutes County. Mm -hmm. we, we have this urban-rural mix and so many people want it to look the same as when they moved here and that's just not what growth looks like so we do typically get appeals on most every land use action that we take um, there's a cost associated with that and by law we are only allowed to take a 250 dollar appeal fee so to a, to appeal a decision that a hearings officer has uh, granted is 250 dollars um, some would say we should raise it but that's dictated by state law so what does that mean in terms of um, cannabis and marijuana? It means that we will probably need to offset some of those costs with that revenue. And then another place is working with our prevention team and public health and looking at gaps within our system of education and awareness. How do we make sure that we keep what's illegal for those under 21 out of the hands that are under 21? So it would be public health, uh, education, and um, prevention working on the community development side to offset the costs and cover the costs that are associated with uh, processing and then also the, the enforcement piece. There seems to be some disagreement about whether that revenue is covering the cost of management. Where do you fall on that? Uh, the revenue coming in from what we're charging for permits? Just not the, just for permits but for you know people who are extrapolating as much as they can about what, what it means to have marijuana farming in the county. Is the 442 or 470 as sure. you're saying, is it, um, is it a benefit for the county financially or is it a negative for the county currently? You know, I've never looked at an industry to say whether it benefits or it hinders us from a financial aspect. Cannabis is uh, legal in the state of Oregon, so it's our job to make sure that we don't discriminate on any new industry. So would I say the same if we were looking at um, you know, any other industry coming in? For me, we do need to cover our costs, which is why we just had a conversation last week to increase the permit cost. So it will be an additional cost for those coming in to go through the land use process to be licensed for um, production. Um, Typically, that's not where I like to be of, of charging more, but for this one, we want to cover the actual cost of service. But for the county at, as an entity, are we generating enough revenue? Um, for us, it was never about following the dollar. It was about following the law. Right. And we want to partner with the state, which they we are agents as the state, essentially, offering public health ser services, education and outreach to the schools, and etc. cetera. Um, so, I don't know if we have enough revenue at this point because I think it's moving so quickly in terms of what the needs are. One thing that I have said though from a state perspective, I feel that it was a bit of a ready fire aim. Um, in bringing on an industry without the ability to truly wrap our arms around the enforcement piece, the public health side I think is an important one because um, you know we have a high onset of um, underage drinking in Deschutes County, underage tobacco use. 
um, our marijuana use is about the state average. But those are things that I think as a community we need to make sure that we are investing in those areas in which we keep our kids safe. Um, but in terms of this industry, I can't tell you whether we have enough revenue yet because I think it's uh, we're still trying to figure out what the costs associated will be. And what I mean, anytime you have a, an enormous uh, change come in like this, I mean, there's going to I mean, our our position has been it's going to take time to work out the kinks. What do you think is a realistic time frame for getting? proper regulations in place and getting to a point where, you know, the county staffers as a whole feel like, okay, we've, you know, we've got our arms around this now. Well, the challenge is, as we sit here today, there are some that are working with legislators over in Salem to take away our right to have regulations. And so any change that we make to the regulations that we currently have will need to withstand an appeal. And quite frankly, I don't know if they are, um, an overreach in terms of being too restrictive. Um, in Oregon, we have the right to farm, which protects crops. This has been deemed a crop by the state legislature. So we have the Oregon Farm Bureau questioning whether we can have the regulations we have today. We have the growers who feel that they're having to go through a process that is more arduous and onerous on them than any other county in the state. There's a reason for that. Again, getting back to that rural and urban, we wanted to find balance. So um, I would say not everyone on that side is happy either. And then you have the community in the middle of the rural residents who are feeling the impact because that's where most of the growing is occurring. So the question of when will that all shuffle itself out, part of it is outside my control in terms of the legislature. But in terms of where we are as a county and what I have authority over, I think if we look at some of the density and um, try to come up with something that helps, uh, cannabis will be, um, well, the, the hemp side is an outright um, allowed use, so the county does not regulate hemp. Uh, we have about seven hemp farms right now in Deschutes County, and they are on the rise. So individuals smelling marijuana, seeing the plants, um, that will occur without any regulation because that is by law how that's set up. Mm -hmm. So in Deschutes County, growing marijuana uh, on the recreational side needs to be indoors. So you shouldn't be able to see it, smell it, um, hear the fans. I mean, we really have been restrictive. The only thing that I could say that may need to be adjusted is the concentration of those approvals in certain areas. Water patterns are important to the um, watering of the plant. So some areas like alfalfa and tumalo have more of a um, density than the other areas. But again, we have 14 in Deschutes County right now. Um, many land use approvals that we have approved right now have not gone forward to the OLCC. It's my understanding the market itself is starting to kind of lighten and soften and, and work its way out. Um, so it's not a linear question or linear answer to your question. There are so many variables. I hope in the next two years, one full legislative session to where if there's any shuffling that needs to occur, it happens in 19. And then the county going forward with what we feel we need to do alongside the community. Um, that'll be happening this year. So two years. Uh, I, I wish it were yesterday, but because uh, you know it's a, it's a very emotional issue, and uh, and I have to base my decisions on the law. So um, that emotion is important, but uh, it's not a finding of fact mm -hmm. that I have to use. I guess I want to piggyback off that a little bit. I'm just thinking about you're describing. Okay, you've got you know you've got the hemp side, you've got the the health authority side, which you are allowed to have purview over those, I understand, right? So the medical, the medical side? We are not. Okay. So we're not allowed to have, so the medical side is oper, um, is overseen by the Oregon Health Authority, mm -hmm. and because it's, it's HIPAA protected information, mm -hmm. a challenge that we have is when we first put in our regulations about a year and a half ago, at that time there were 1,749 licensed medical marijuana grows. Mm -hmm. There are 984 right now. Mm -hmm. So the county is not allowed, we're not privy of that information to know where they are and to know whether they are operating within the license that they've been given through OHA. 
OHA oversees over 20,000 licensed medical marijuana grows, and they have two individuals that are able to do the enforcement. So that's one of the reasons why bringing on local enforcement will be able to assist in that. Um, the law enforcement, the district attorney. So they will be able to assist in the health authority, or in, in the medical grow regulation and check, checking on them, code enforcement kind of things? In a way, so the way that it'll work, we asked OHA to send us a list, uh, not us, but law enforcement, mm -hmm. who's uh, privy to that information, a list of where the medical marijuana grow sites are, and what type of license they have, how many plants should they be allowed. So when we get a complaint, we know what is lawful mm -hmm. for that individual, both the protection of the person who's licensed and the neighbors who have questions. When you say we in this context, are you talking about law enforcement? Are you talking about code enforcement or your code officers? Or So right now it would be code officers okay. that want to be able to do that. Okay. The reason why that's not working is because from They don't have access to the list. They don't. Mm -hmm. So the district attorney and the sheriff just asked OHA for that list. Mm -hmm. They were denied. Mm -hmm. So they sent every ad every address in Deschutes County to OHA, asking them to confirm or deny which of those addresses have a license. It's a little cheeky approach, but what they told us is that they have a hotline that we can call, mm -hmm. uh, we being law enforcement, mm -hmm. and on every complaint, dial and give the address, but yeah. you may not know exactly where the address is, because you're, you know, your smell or uh, different things. Um, so it's a huge waste of resources. And so the 984, knowing where they are so that there's a registry for law enforcement, will really cut down on what is the problem. Mm -hmm. Is the problem, we know it's not the recreational side. There are 14 and we just did an annual report. Mm -hmm. They're operating under the law. These 984, is a, they're unknown. And the ones that that were before the 984, the 1749, OHA does not determine whether or not they uh, forfeited their license if they stopped growing. So all you would have to do is just say, I'm not gonna uh, apply for a license and renewal this year. And they're gonna say, thank you, okay. But there's no checking to make sure that they then, in fact, stop growing. So that's the question that we need to answer because the state is unable to, mostly from a, yes, it's offsetting costs that the state should be providing, but from a public safety and from a responsiveness to the community perspective, I think it makes sense. The question that I was trying to get at was, now this seems like almost like the you, you and this is lumping you in with law enforcement, that you are taking on something that actually isn't under your purview then, right? You're, you're concerned about something that isn't necessary by, by the system for you to actually to do, about, right? Yes and no. So medical marijuana under our regulations need to follow the same regulations in terms of land use, which is the county's code. Okay, so that's the part. So that's where it gets so yep. muddy. And it does. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, when we go to a property to make sure that they are abiding, it would be complaint driven. I mean, mm -hmm. we're not trying to go and just knock on doors and be heavy handed, but it's clear that there are individuals who feel impacted and we can't answer the question of, are they legal or are they not? And we do hear that we are overproducing marijuana in the state of Oregon. Mm -hmm. Where is that coming from? I'm not. It, I, it's not coming from the 14 that are licensed. Mm -hmm. Is it coming from the 984 that are on the medical side? We don't know. So when we go to make sure that they are abiding by the regulations, the same as the recreational side does, we don't know how many plants they should have. We don't know what they are licensed or if they're licensed. But the hotline would have told you that, right? So you, right. as long as you, I mean, you can get a hold of the hotline, then you can. But the first question is, what is the address to call the hotline mm -hmm. with? So we get a call from a neighbor and they say, there is a profound smell or a lot of traffic or some sort of an impact. Now, in a radius, we need to try to determine where that's coming from. And we don't have the right to go on a property because that's just, I mean, that's not what, what you do unless you have probable cause that something's occurring. Mm -hmm. So the resource now of trying to figure out which one of those properties, are they licensed, and which is great once we can start a registry, but my question to OHA, if we can call a hotline and get the information, why not just let us know where they are so that we can have them be on a register that's 
a legal registry. Mm -hmm. It protects them as a licensee and it really assists law enforcement to not be wasting resources sitting on a hotline trying to figure out which one of these addresses is licensed and if none of them are, now we need to go in and find out which one is causing an issue. Mm -hmm. And then is it four plants, is it eight, are they growing hemp? I mean it really, there's a lot of detail in terms of, of what that might mean. I mean, this I'm is sure a, it's a trust issue. This is a philosophical sure. question also, right. but I watched the, the you know, the uh, meeting that you had with when you, two weeks ago when you had the report right. out from the legal grows, and odor seemed to be the issue. Do you feel that odor is a, is a public safety issue? And should we be spending this much time on it? And I know this yeah. goes back to, again, these are dictates from on high about time, right. manner, place, and I guess odor falls into that, but. Sure, so the question for us is, in Deschutes County, we put forward with a marijuana advisory committee that recommended to us regulations, and the industry was on that committee. Mm -hmm. One of the things that you should not be able, in a large scale, in Deschutes County is smell the uh, potency of marijuana. Mm -hmm. That was a uh, consensus that in order for this industry to be welcome, legalized, and um, roll out, that was something that they did not appeal, and that is part of our regulations. Mm -hmm. So when people are impacted by smell, is that something that is a public safety ha um, hazard? No. Um, is that part of our regulations for land use? Yes. Mm -hmm. So it was one of the consensus ideas that they came together and said, you know, we're going to we're going to say that this is something that um, there are ways that you can mitigate that. And from a neighbor to neighbor perspective, from a large scale grow, they felt that it was something that they'd be willing to do. Mm -hmm. So um, no, it's not public safety, but yes, it would be against county code regulations. Mm -hmm. I'm going to change tack here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, I know that mental health has been a big part of um, your work at the county level. What do you think the future holds for uh, mental health resources at the county as um, our population continues to grow and um, it seems that more of the more people with mental health issues are take, taking refuge or housing in the county? So. Uh, um, first and foremost, I think that our statewide system, and again, we operate as agents of the state, um, so we provide service and we are the mental health authority as counties. So the system, in my opinion, is completely fragmented and it's more, um, we've developed different systems and created a system of care that has been piecemeal, not, uh, if we were to design the system today, would it look like what we have? The answer is absolutely not. So there's an initiative happening right now that's starting with our children's system of care. There are 12 people that have been asked to come together and it's led by NAMI, the National Alliance for the Mentally Ill. And so it allows the ability for us to totally look at the system and redesign it in a way that gets us to the outcomes that we want. It's what services do we need in order to meet the needs of the community, not what services do we have today, and then how do we fit the community into it. Right. It's critical because we did the same thing in 2013, looking at the public health system. Public health system in Oregon, we had um, big pockets of the state that was not able to respond to a public health crisis. And so at the very minimum, we needed to make sure that everywhere in the state of Oregon had the same level of those foundational capabilities to meet a community's needs. So it's taking what we learned in that process and applying it to the mental health system. So it's a toe in the water with just starting with our children's system, but I can't think of a better place to start. Mm -hmm. So that work is ongoing. Then the next piece is, how does the county respond when there are a lot of changes within the system? So you will probably have seen St. Charles Family Care and um, others getting into providing care. For the county, it's we need to recognize that the system is growing and that with the Medicaid population and the coordinated care organizations that we have now, which is one in four in Deschutes County, is provided service through Medicaid, how do we make sure that the county is in the right swim lane providing service and not trying to provide service that others can provide? So in answer to what will it look like going into the future, we are right now identifying areas in which we need to strengthen what we do and we do best while working in coordination with others in the community that provide service. So we're not duplicating, but we are strengthening 
Um, like we handle the SPMI, the significant persistent mentally ill, that that core group of individuals can be incredibly disruptive in a uh, just your standard clinic uh, environment. Um, you know, really needing to for us to be able to. Um, bring them in, a, in an environment that meets their needs, not necessarily just your standard clinician. So that's an area in which the county really um, provides great levels of service, and that's where the hospital and other providers want to see us providing service. So you'll see some adjustments. We won't probably be doing quite as much of your lower level, um, you know, interlevel type of uh, less acuity uh, mental health needs, mm -hmm. but certainly strengthening those higher level, more acute, um, the other place that we're strengthening is the crisis intervention work, and so we have a forensic team that now um, is working. We have crisis intervention teams which work, work with law enforcement, but we have a, for, a forensic diversion team, we, uh, it was, used to be called a jail diversion, to where we're actually getting people out of the system, the emergency room and the, um, the jail, and getting them into other parts of the community. And that has been, we, we touch maybe the same person two or three times in a day, but that forensic team knows the individuals, they know how to keep, uh, help them be well and be safe, and also help the community too with livability, and um, there can be some fear around that, which um, is not good for the client or for, um, you know, I'm thinking of the downtown challenges that people talk about. Uh, but most important, we're looking at bringing on a crisis respite center that also has a sobering station. It would be the only one on this side of the mountain. And that's 23-hour um, care. 24 hours is a, um, it's a different level of service. But this really is getting an individual in crisis off the street into a safe environment, um, get them some, you know, triaged into the right level of service. And if that means detox, or if that means uh, maybe uh, working with Sageview or Brooks over in Redmond, it's an entry point that's uh, humane and that is welcoming and that serves the needs of a part of our population that really has been underserved. You, Go ahead. <laughs> you're mentioning a lot about about the the side of existing mental health and just having you know gone through the recent school shootings. Uh. Um, I'm curious about your thoughts on the preventative side and especially with youth and schools.